I'm going to talk to you a little bit about data structures, which, as it turns out, are really complicated. I don't know if you know this, but they are. Um, I was not aware of quite how complicated they were going into this. And we'll see uh, maybe a couple of ways of making them simpler and more relatable and getting a, a more intuitive understanding of what's going on. And then we'll look at some pretty pictures for the rest of the talk, or at least some pictures. OK. So I said data structures are, are complicated. Um, a, a lot of that complexity is, is accidental complexity. Uh, you probably all know the difference between accidental complexity, which is kind of unnecessary, and inherent complexity. And I figured you did, so um, the quotes up there aren't actually, because I'm introducing a new term, those are actually scare quotes. Uh, while I was researching this talk, I uncovered evidence of a vast international conspiracy going back decades, whose sole purpose seems to be to obfuscate data structures and their terminology so that folks like you and I won't be able to understand them. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, one you know, easy breakdown in data structures is between abstract data structures, which are an API. It's just a list of operations, um, like a protocol or a type class or an abstract class, and the implementation. right? And we would never confuse the API with the implementation. We just wouldn't do that. Um, so let's see how we fare with data structures by playing a little game that I like to call uh, abstract or concrete. <laughs> So you're going to have to raise your hand quite a bit for this one. Um, I've given this to over 100 developers. Uh, every one of them has gotten at least one of these wrong. And some of the most experienced have gotten all of them wrong. So there's no shame here at all. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call out a data structure, and then I'll ask you whether it's abstract. Raise your hand, and then I'll say concrete. Raise your hand. OK, ready? So here we go. How about a stack? Is that abstract? OK. Or is that concrete? OK, good. Uh, so that is abstract. It, it's two operations, push and pop. We need both of those operations to be a stack, and we've got different implementations that can fulfill that. Um, so let the record show it was maybe an 80-20 split there. I can't see everyone clearly, though. Actually, let's get a baseline. Who knows what a persistent data structure is? OK, wow, a lot of you. That's great. Maybe I can speed through those slides. <laughs> um, and who has heard the phrase data structure before? Good. OK. So we're at about 90% uh, of you are, are playing along. That's excellent. So how about a linked list? Is that abstract? Or is that concrete? OK. Uh, that is concrete. It defines an actual in-memory structure for the data. It has performance implications. Um, but it also gives us operations that can fulfill different APIs. Uh, so how about a queue? Is that abstract? Or is a queue concrete? OK. Uh, so yes, uh, a queue is abstract. You're catching on. This is excellent. Um, how about a list? Just a plain old list. Is that abstract? Or is that concrete? Yeah, so a list is abstract. Um, it defines a few operations. We need to be able to probably append and prepend, and then we'd like to take a head and a tail or something, right? Um, so how about an array? Is that abstract? A few of you. Is that concrete? Many more of you. An array is actually both. <laughs> so you're all wrong. <laughs> uh, an array is, is uh, essentially a list with uh, random access on it, uh, random access operation. And it's also the data structure that fulfills it. So this is yet another way that, uh, that they are working very hard to confuse you. Uh, there's a whole bunch more of these. I'm going to skip through them now for the, in the interest of time. But this is a really fun party game that you can play with your friends. And it, it gets harder <laughs> later on. So let me give you some quick rules of thumb to distinguish between these two. Um, uh, generic terms are abstract. So if you have a term like a tree or a graph or a map or a set or a bag, those are all abstract, um, except there's some irregular cases. These are not all of them. You just have to memorize them. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, if you have adjectives, that tends to imply that you're dealing with a concrete data structure, uh, unless you have too many adjectives, like a self-balancing <laughs> binary search tree. Um, I, uh, think for a minute, don't answer, but think for a minute about whether that's abstract or concrete. Um, or you have too few adjectives, right? 
Uh, priority queue is a particularly nasty one because that has an adjective in front of a, an abstract data structure. It sounds like it should be concrete. And the most common implementation of this is a heap, which sounds like it should be abstract. And so people use the term heap to mean priority queue, and they use the term priority queue to mean heap, which, uh, you know, I mean, you're wrong, but you're only a little bit wrong, and it's, it's okay. There's no, there's no shame there, uh, but these are different things. Okay, and now you know that they're different things. Um, if it has the creator's name in it, then it is definitely concrete. There are no exceptions. <laughs> Always. In fact, we can relax this rule a little bit and say if it's got a proper name in it at all, then it's concrete. Even if that proper name is just like a historical figure or uh, <laughs> I haven't looked up there yet. There's supposed to be more of a margin on the side, but that's okay. My slides are not beautiful anyway. Um, if it's a historical figure or it happens to be the, the inventor's daughter or it's just an acronym that isn't even a proper name at all but happens to be Patricia, then it's concrete. No exceptions. None. <clears throat> um, right, so self-balancing binary search tree. Uh, data structures form these families of kind of refinement and improvement over time. Uh, if the root node of that family, like a, a heap or a tree with an I, who says, who pronounces tree with an I, tree? Like five people. Who pronounces it try? That, that's good. Try is a much better way. I, does anyone pronounce it tree with an I with finger quotes? Is that just me? <laughs> okay. Um, so if your root node of this family tree is concrete, then you're in luck because anytime you're talking about a try, you're definitely talking about a concrete data structure. And it's easy to tell the difference. If your root node is neither concrete nor abstract, if it's, if it's nothing, like a self-balancing binary search tree, then you're in trouble because you might be talking about one of the particular implementations in this collection, or you may be talking about the entire collection, or you may be talking about uh, the API that you've abstracted from the operations that are common among the elements of the collection. And so the answer to is it abstract or concrete is just, it's complicated. Uh, it, it depends on context. So another way we can break these down is whether they're persistent or ephemeral. About half of you know what persistent data structures are already, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. Ephemeral is just a fancy word for not persistent. Uh, ephemeral data structure is just a moment in time. Um, I, I think I have time to give you my Lego example. Okay, so uh, if you buy a set of Legos and you build a Lego castle, then at the end you've got a Lego castle and you don't know anything about its past, you just know what it is at the moment, and it's a perfectly fine Lego castle. That's ephemeral. If you buy a bunch of sets of Legos, and uh, on the first one, you take out one Lego and put it on a little pedestal, and from the second box, you take out two Legos and connect them together and put them on a pedestal, and then third one. And when you get to the end, you've got a Lego castle, and you've got all of the history laid out, that's a persistent data structure. Now this is an incredibly expensive way to get a persistent data structure, obviously, because you've got to buy a lot of sets of Legos, and it takes you a long time to put them together. So you have both space and time uh, issues, uh, expenses. But we can actually do better than that. We don't have to deal with regular Legos. We can use magical Legos. And there's one weird trick that you need to know that lets you get from regular Legos to magical Legos, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, we can also improve on this, though. We can talk about fully persistent data structures. Um, so here we're introducing a bit of uh, 90s surfer slang into our data structure terminology. I'm fully stoked. I'm fully persistent. I was going to do a surfer accent, but it, I tried it, and it was just terrible. Um, so with a fully persistent data structure, we can take any item in our history and build on it, and we also get a fully persistent data structure. So we can not only read our history, we can also take an item from it and begin building on it. Um, another way of thinking of this is that we could all get a Lego castle, and we all have our little Lego castle, and we start building on it, right? And if I happen to see your Lego castle, and I like it more than mine, I can chuck mine and grab yours and use it instead of mine. And that's a very nice property to have, and we can do this with, with our one weird trick by sharing uh, the base Legos that we use, and I can copy yours without actually paying the expense of it. So now, uh, now our conspiracy is back to its old tricks. They're introducing archaic English. Uh, the word confluence, of course, is where two rivers meet. All of us know that. Um, but this is not obvious at all what confluently persistent means. It just means that we can take one of those branches and merge it back in. 
So if you're, um, if I like your Lego structure better than I like my Lego castle, but I like some of the features of my Lego castle, I don't have to throw mine away. I can take your Lego castle, merge it with mine, and start building on that new Lego castle. That's a wonderful property to have. So what does this remind you of? <laughs> Git, yes. So the next time you're at a party and someone is talking about confluently persistent data structures, say to them, oh, you mean like Git? Uh, hilarity will ensue. In fact, <laughs> you can walk away at that point and come back like 20 minutes later and they'll still be going on about this, right? It, it's amazing. But, but they really are pretty much exactly like Git. It's a great example of the types of options that these data structures give you. Okay, so here's our one weird trick. Uh, we make a tree. What we want is a list of numbers, for example. Um, but if we have a list of numbers and we want to change one of those, then we have to copy the entire list of numbers and put our changed one in in order to have persistence, in order to keep track of that history. We've just got regular Legos. If we make a tree out of it by chopping up that list into smaller lists that point to each other, uh, or maybe we can make a try and put all of the values at the bottom, then we can do this thing where we walk down the tree, make a new copy of just the little sublist down here, and then make pointers back up that uh, take only log in time and log in extra space to give you persistence. This is amazing. As it turns out, trees are also really nice for parallelism. Uh, Guy Steele gave a talk here a few years back about using trees instead of lists uh, because of parallelism benefits. Uh, I suggest you watch it, it's really good. Okay, so we've got consequences for being concrete. Uh, time consequences, space consequences, space-time implications. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. And so what we end up with is these huge charts and graphs and tables. This is a tiny slice of a tiny slice of the data structures, right? I mean, you're not supposed to be able to read this, but you're essentially comparing operations on one axis to uh, data structures, concrete implementations on another axis. And then you're, you know, in theory, going off in a third dimension and looking at all the different performance and spatial implications. This is terrible, right? How do we, how do we make this relatable? I'm, I'm staring at this mountain of data, and suddenly it hits me. Baseball. Baseball is the answer. So this is from a newspaper 100 years ago. They had the same problem. This is one game, right? One game between two teams in a season that had, I don't know, hundreds of games? What's an order of magnitude estimate for games? 162. in 162. Wow. That's much better than an order of magnitude estimate. Thank you. Uh, so imagine this times 162 times various seasons um, with actually a lot more stats in there, right? Uh, so how do we make this relatable? Well, obviously, we make baseball cards out of it, right? So I suggest to you that the answer here to make data structures relatable is to make data structure cards. <laughs> now, this is my original implementation uh, in Photoshop and Comic Sans. Um, <laughs> my partner in crime, Henry Faber, was reviewing my slides late last night, and he said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to let you burn their eyeballs out. Uh, so he re-implemented these for me in a much nicer form using the premier uh, 20th 21st century uh, typing tool, OmniGraffle. Um, so here we have our stack. It's got a push and pop operation like we talked about. And here we've got a linked list. Um, and so we can compare these together, and we can see that, uh, indeed, a linked list makes a really good stack. It's got fast push and pop operations, which is exactly what we want. Uh, so what if we take a queue um, and compare that to a linked list? Well, uh, that's not so good anymore. And so you can start to think about maybe rules emerging for gameplay with these cards, right? Um, and trying to uh, put them together in ways that actually give you nice properties and fulfill things. So maybe you lose a turn here because uh, your shifting is going to be, well, in this case, it's going to be quite dire uh, if you have a fully persistent linked list. So uh, maybe you lose two turns. Um, if you have a, a tail pointer and you allow mutation, then you lose your persistence, but you gain the ability to fulfill this quickly. But that's a different card, right? That's a different data structure. That's part of the expansion pack. Okay. Uh, so 
we could have a, a doubly linked list that actually fulfills our queue quickly, but it's ephemeral or uh, ephemeral. Uh, that was my fault. I sent Henry the text for these also very late last night. Um, so our doubly linked list is ephemeral and it mutates, um, which probably causes some type of effect in our game that we're imagining. Um, but it makes a dandy queue. So if you can handle those properties, then this is a great way to go. Uh, here's a batched queue, which is a nice way of doing a queue persistently. And I want you to remember this one. Most of the others you can kind of let slide by. Keep this in your head. We're going to have two stacks. We're going to push onto one stack and pop off the other stack. And when our popping stack gets empty, we're going to pop the first item off of the push stack and push it onto our pop stack and just reverse it, right? And then that will be our new pop stack, and we've got our push stack. Um, Raise your hand if you're familiar with this already. OK, raise your hand if you're not familiar with this and my explanation made sense. OK, good. That's, that's much better than I expected, actually. Great. Um, so we've got some nice properties here. We're amortized, and we're, uh, that's not a nice property, actually. Uh, we've got a bad property, which is that we're amortized, which kills our hard real-time guarantees. So what that means is that when we go to pop, every now and then we're going to have to do this big shifting operation. But if you think about an item going in, it undergoes four operations. It gets pushed, it gets popped, uh, it gets pushed again, and then it gets popped again. So we are constant time over the long span, but we're amortized, which means that we're going to occasionally have to pay a big cost at a sudden moment. So we'll have this. Uh, if you're doing a hard real-time system or something like that, you can't really use things like this. So you can modify the data structure a little, which would be a different card, and end up with better properties for this. If you're staying around for RacketCon, they've got like 12 versions of this. There's like a, a physicist queue and a banker's queue and a chemist queue, maybe an astronaut queue. I don't know. There's all kinds of them. Um, so this is a deck uh, which confusingly often has a U and an E on the end of it. So it's DQ, which is one of the other operations that you can do on a deck. Uh, but then some smart person decided to DQ a few, op a few letters off of the end of it and call it a deck, and this is, this is just another example of uh, the ambiguity and, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, our doubly linked list is a great deck. Um, how do we get a deck that is persistent? Um, so I was gonna talk about two, three finger trees uh, which make dandy decks. I'm gonna just skip ahead and show you a terrible hasher and map tree slide. I apologize, Henry didn't get a chance to remake this one. Hash array map tries are lovely. A try means we've got everything down at the bottom. Um, in this case, we're walking down with sections of the key. So we take five bits of the key that we're looking for uh, after hashing it. That's the hashing part. And then we take the first five bits of that hash and we look at where to go from there. So uh, that five bits gives you an array of size 32. I'm saying a lot of words without really explaining them very well. Here are the things that I want you to remember about this. Uh, they're very useful data structures, and they involve arrays of size 32. So keep those two things in your head, and maybe we'll be OK in the next section. OK. Um, hey, this is really good. Uh, I'm at 20 minutes now, and usually when I've practiced this, I've been at 40 minutes now. So this gives us much more time for the next section, which I'm excited about. Um, so the question is, I've shown you a whole bunch of different data structures um, and maybe some ways to think about them and classify them and get a little more, make them a little more relatable. But how do we, um, how do we deal with the data that's already in our systems? Or you know, maybe you have a library that has some data structures in it and you don't quite know what they are. Well, one way to do that is to you know, take a snapshot of that data every now and then and dig through it and try to figure out what they're doing. Another way to do it, the more obvious way, is to look at the code. Right? So you go into the code and you try to figure out what they're doing with this data structure and what the properties are there. Uh, so I'm going to show you a different way of trying to do that. Um, and we'll be doing it in JavaScript, which has some pros and cons. Uh, let's see. Can you see this? Is that visible? I bet you can see that. OK. All right. So let's say we've got a really simple data thing. This is just an array of size 3. Um, and we'd like to render that. 
So what are we looking at over here? This is, um, let's actually make x bigger. Uh, we're going to take some sequential numbers. We'll take 88 of them, 88 of them, and we'll render that. So our render is really simple. It's just a pipeline uh, that kind of flattens things, and then it colorizes them, evaluates them, and then colorizes them, and then kind of pushes them up here in our display. So here are the important parts that you need to know for this right now. Uh, we're going to display values based on their, or display colors, rather, uh, that correlate to these values. So one is up here, it's red, and 88 is down here, it's green. And there's a black bit on either side, and that's because when we flatten these things out, um, we want to be able to see what's inside of them in terms of their kind of steps that we're taking up and down. So we're going to color those as well. Uh, we're going to color them black in particular. So here we've got a bunch of black dots because we're kind of walking up and down. Okay. So what if we make a Y and we'll fill it with some random numbers, because uh, that'll be fun. And then we're just going to say array.observe, and we're going to ask our browser to observe y. And we'll feed it a function, which is just render y. And this almost fits on the screen. Oh, I got it right. Good. Uh, maybe we'll move this over slightly. OK. And now we can say y uh, push. Um, and we'll just push a random number into it. And uh, we'll do that a couple more times. And then maybe we'll say y shift and pop something off. And so we can actually, as we're mutating y, uh, we're in mutational land. As we're mutating y, we're watching it happen on the screen. So what if we combine these two operations together, and we push in a random number, and then we also shift off. So this is what it ends up looking like. You can see down here at the bottom, uh, maybe I'll do this a few more times. Actually, this is really annoying. Uh, so. We'll do this instead. Good. OK. So as I push this magical button that I just created, uh, you can see items going in on the bottom. That's the new colors that are appearing, and items going off the top. And you can tell that it's working as a cube because it doesn't increase in size. It's just fixed. OK. Does everyone understand that? OK. I think I've belabored that enough. Um, let's look at a slightly more interesting example. Uh, this is that simple queue that we just saw. This is a trickier queue. Um, it's working as a queue, but there's some weird stuff happening in there. OK, so let's see if we can figure out what the algorithm for tricky queue is just by looking at this visualization. Okay? Uh, so the first thing that we notice is that it is, in fact, a queue. This is not increasing in size. We've got new things coming in on the bottom, and we've got stuff leaving on the top. We can also see that it's quite flat because we only walk down once. That's this black line up here. And we walk back up once. OK, so far, so good. It's exactly like our queue. But then we've got these spans, like here. Can you see the pointer OK, the mouse? Yeah? OK. Um, we've got these spans, like this first one here, where nothing is happening, almost nothing is happening. Um, so we must not be pushing or popping at that point. And we've got these red things appearing here. So I guess every once in a while, we're pushing a particular value in at this particular level. <clears throat> Maybe this is 20 pixels in. I've zoomed the pixels out, so they're like 5 by 5 squares uh, just for this part of the demonstration. And then we've got the same thing happening down here with the blue. We're pushing something in there. Does that make sense? OK, what if I push this button? What happens now? Well, uh, we've got these purple things appearing, and they seem to appear fairly regularly. So I must be pushing some values in every, I don't know, 10 values or something. OK. So maybe we've, <laughs> so I, I actually know what this algorithm is since I wrote it, and uh, that's exactly what it is. Um, now let's look at something that I haven't looked at the code for, didn't write, and haven't looked at the data of. There are two different persistent data structure libraries for JavaScript. There's actually a lot of them. But a classic one is Mori that takes closure scripts, data structures, and brings them over. And a new one is Facebook's uh, Immutable JS. So I want to just look at some pictures of those data structures and see if we can actually get some insight. 
So let's play through. Uh, this is zoomed out now, so one pixel really is one pixel. We'll play through this queue a bit, and then we'll stop it and see if we can figure out what's going on. OK. So the first thing we notice is these black bars here. We're pushing values in along here. And then here we start popping them off. So we're populating the queue, and then we're popping things off. This is not really a queue. It's just their vector implementation, but I'm using it as a queue. OK, so we notice this banding here with these thick black bars. Uh, this seems to indicate that we've got these size 32 arrays. So they're probably using, using a hash array map tree try under the hood. Uh, we also have these darker areas here. And the darker areas indicate that we've stepped down a level. So these things are happening further down in our data structure tree than these things. And we can see that we kind of accumulate into one of these, and then we place it over here. We just pop it up a level. Um, so this must be some kind of tail that they're using as an accumulator. And then when it gets to size 32, we pop that up here. We also have this other interesting feature, uh, which is this bar at the top. And all four of these, four or five of these pixels have the same, oh, except this bottom one. So I don't know if you can see this, but there's a, a solid color line here, uh, which is some type of metadata that isn't changing. And then everything else starts off at the same value. So maybe we'll guess that that's 0. Um, and then flows through. So we're increasing, increasing, increasing. And then suddenly, we switch over. And this one cuts back to maybe 0. And then these two start doing something else. I've stared at these a lot longer than you have. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you a guided tour, but hopefully this is making a little bit of sense. And then this weird jaggediness down here uh, correlates with two things. One is this little bump when we run out of one of our buckets here, uh, then we make a jump. So we run out of the bucket here, and we have our new tail starting here. Um, so we finished our tail. We make a new bucket out of that tail. This is our new full bucket. Uh, we can see the tails are still a little darker down here. And then we start a new tail. But just after we start that, we are shifting up here. I want to show you one more feature on this, and then we'll look at Maury's version, uh, which is this little tiny bump right here. And it seems like a glitch. Uh, essentially, we're pushing a new pixel down here, this colored bit. But up here, we're not popping anything off. So what? <clears throat> what is going on there? It seems like something has just gone awry, but every single time I run this, this happens. I have no idea why, because I wanted to come in just like you, fresh and not having looked at the code here. But there is something interesting happening maybe eight steps into using this as a queue after we start popping. Um, and I'd love to know what that is. All right, so let's look at Maury's version. OK, so pretty much the same thing so far. This is good. Uh, we understand what's happening. We're loading in a tail uh, into these buckets. We've got a little more metadata up here. And then, oh, dear. <laughs> uh, so that's a lot different. That, that's, that's my alarm telling me that uh, I should have moved on to this point by now, which I have. So that's good. Um, OK. so. Oh, does that affect? No, it doesn't. It's only for me. But it makes me happier. So OK, so we've got some metadata here. And that doesn't seem to ever change. OK, that's fine. Um, we've, <laughs> whoo, uh, we've got a bunch more metadata up here. Otherwise, this seems to be more or less the same as the Facebook version that we were seeing. But then something really weird happens. So right here is where we start popping. Uh, I happen to know that because we're popping at the same point as the Facebook one, uh, which is like 200 values or something. And as soon as we start popping, we get this really weird effect where this part of the data structure is now here, but we're not actually popping anything off. And then we've got this other part of the data structure that's accumulating things. So what does this remind you of? a batched queue, right? We looked at a data structure that worked as a queue that used two stacks. And 
So we're, we're building up one thing here, and then as soon as we start popping, that thing goes here. Nothing comes off of it, oddly enough. Uh, and then we start building up a second thing. And then something weird happens here, and then we start building up another thing. And it looks like, if we look at these colors, that this actually pops up here at this point. So we've got some other strange features. Um, this looks like, I don't know, is that metadata or is that a copy of something? It's hard to tell. But we've got this weird area in the middle. Uh, some of the metadata from up here seems to move down to here, so that's fine. We won't worry about that. It looks like it's maybe size information. It's increasing. So what, what is this middle chunk? Well, this is exactly this. And this is exactly this. So these are pointers. They're a little, they're shaded a little bit. They're, they're darker because they're one level down in the tree uh, than this stuff that they're pointing to. So what it looks like is happening is that we're, we're taking a bucket here and putting a pointer to it here. And then probably this is maybe 32 across and 32 high. So we're popping things off. And then we're doing that again and doing that again and doing that again. And then when we run out, we get this strange effect where <laughs> Uh, like our, our last little, oh, I see, that's what this is. This is the previous tail that's left over here getting copied up here. Okay, I didn't actually know that. Um, so here's our little tail bit, and so that's why this chunk is shifted up. And then when we're done, we just throw away the entire thing, right? So this is actually really nice because this, in some ways, has some garbage collection implications where we're collecting each of these buckets every time we get done with them. Here, we're only collecting the buckets uh, once when, when that entire stack is done and we just collect it all at once, right? Instead of popping things off. Um, this is probably because in JavaScript, uh, shifting things off is a really expensive operation. Okay, is this making sense? Kind of? Ish. All right. Let's look at maps. Um, so here's a random map in the Facebook system without the black bars. And here's the same map in the Mori system. And these look pretty similar. Like this one's growing a little more slowly, but it's going to be hard to tell the difference between them. It looks like this data and this data maybe correlate somehow. Maybe this is metadata because it's all one color. I don't know. Um, let's look at these with the black bars on. That's growing really fast. Uh, OK, let's look at Mori with the black bars on. It doesn't necessarily, oh, that's interesting. So we've got this jump here that clearly indicates that after we get to I don't know, maybe that's 32, then we jump and do something different. Um, so the fact that this one grows so quickly in our picture doesn't necessarily indicate that it's using more space uh, because we're only showing numbers and jumps up here. But it is, they, they are very different data structures now, right? Uh, this one seems to be using our old friend, the ham T. And this one is, I don't know what. There's lots and lots and lots of little tiny sub-objects in here. Um, OK. Let's look at this sequentially. So before, I was just inserting random numbers. Uh, the keys are strings, so it's the, the number with a letter appended. Now we're putting numbers in sequentially, and we see really distinct banding patterns happening. So we can guess a few things. One, um, we can guess that this is the data in this middle section, and that the data is being hashed in some curious fashion that keeps changing over time. Uh, we've got a lot of metadata up here. If we turn on the black bars, uh, I won't do that. So let's see Mori sequentially adding things. We've got our strange little starting point up here again. Um, but we're growing in a much different fashion, right? So whereas these are clearly banded, and you can see that they're probably using a modulo operation for the hash of some kind, um, here we're growing in an entirely different fashion. Uh, and it looks like, I don't know, 
Oh, and we're starting to get some banding where we skip around. Let's turn on the black bars for a moment. And we see we've got these big, wide data containers. Uh, this is probably our hash array map tree at these banding points, having new elements added to it. And if we try this one sequential again, uh, then we slow down our computer a lot and get just this very linear progression uh, because none of this is changing at all. So I can't tell you exactly what the implementations are under the hood, but I can, we can already tell a lot about these data structures just from looking at these pictures that are being generated in, a, in an incredibly simplistic fashion. Um, really, in some ways, the most simplistic fashion that we possibly could, right? And it's maybe five pages of JavaScript to generate this, which means if you're in a more expressive language, it's going to be half a page, right? Uh, if you happen to be using J, it's probably a one-liner. Uh, we're just flattening things down and then throwing it up there based on value. But we don't have to do that. We could show a difference between uh, the previous state and this state. We could take into account data locality. Uh, we could perform a discrete Fourier transform over the data that we're showing and uh, maybe get like a three-dimensional image. So we start to see how frequent the updates to different areas of the data structure are. If you have this running in a real application, I think that would be quite revealing of the actual utility of your data structure in your application. Um, and it, you know, again, this is in JavaScript, so we're, we're limited. At the, at the bottom, we've just got objects and arrays, and they're both implemented however the browser engine wants to implement them. But in your language of choice, you could do this and peek inside your running systems and actually see what's going on inside there um, at a level that uh, I think would be really interesting to explore. So back to the slides. And we count to three while this slowly does its thing. Uh, remember your rules of thumb. They're very helpful for parties. Uh, data structure cards, very exciting. And uh, visualize your data, because you, you never know what you're going to find in there. All right, uh, I'm Dan. Uh, I think I've exhausted all my time, so I'll take questions offline. Thank you.